Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome to Breaking Banks. Uh, I am your host. As you guys are aware, Breaking Banks is the number one fintech radio show and podcast globally with over 7 million listeners in 180 countries coming up on our eighth anniversary. Joining me in the hot seat today as co-host is Jason Hendricks. Jason, welcome back. Thanks I don't. For having me. How can I say welcome back? Right, you're, it's like you're the host as well. So I'm like, I think I did. Thanks last for joining show, me. Actually, <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. So thanks for joining me on this one. Um, anyway, um, we're also talking to Anil Ag Agarwal. I hope I got that right, Anil. He's been a fintech guy for over 20 years. Um, you you may know of him from his involvement with Money 2020 as the former founder of that. He's He's been the CEO of two fintechs. Um, one was acquired uh, successfully by Google, uh, Tsys, um, uh, or, or sorry, TXVIA in, uh, in, in 2012, and then Tsys in 2004 pr prior to that. Um, but as as we say, you know, we most of uh, the fintech audience probably knows him from his work as the founder and CEO of Money Twenty Twenty. In uh, January, he launched a new fintech event sort of thing called fintech meetup which we're going to get into um a little unconventional and we're delighted to have him join us to talk about this latest event and the role it'll play in catalyzing the modernization of payments banking etc welcome anil thank you so much brett and jason feels like it I have a a coming here <laughs> <laughs> i have a question to start right now that we're on the other side of 2020 Right. And it seemed when you started Money 2020, like that year was so far out. No way. What were you thinking from a branding, you know, point of view? And you were naming it like, were you actually thinking, hey, there's something monumental. The 2020, 2020 is just the future, man. <laughs> just the future. Yeah, no, it really was at the time a reference to the year 2020. Uh, it's a, um, you know, this we're talking about an event that was started 10 years ago. And a decade is, I guess, in some ways, a really long time and a lot can happen. And in other ways, it's kind of a short period of time when you're talking about the kind of transformation that industries go through. Uh, but here we find ourselves, you know, 10 years later, and it absolutely was a reference to the year when we, when we first uh, uh, started it. But, uh, you know, as the year got closer, you know, we put a put a slash between the two twenties and and made it more about uh, vision. But uh, ten years have gone by super fast. Well, so you know, let's talk about that. Um, maybe let's jump into the the formation of of money 2020 the ideation of it obviously back in 2010 um you know fintech was still very new um you know and so 20 2011 was when you guys started to uh, to put this together um tell me about that the sort of foundational period and and why you thought that, you know first of all money 2020 was um was needed for the uh, the sector sure you know, Brett, as you mentioned, I was an operator in fintech. I actually started in 1999 as a 29-year-old. Uh, I won't disclose how old I am now, but um, that was pretty early on. And, and, you know, if I were to describe the decade from, you know, let's call it 2000 to 2010, when it came to fintech, it seemed like most of the opportunities were really relegated to the long tail. So, you know, personally, for example, I was, you know, involved in, in the creation and development of two issuing processes. Uh, but when we look at the, the use cases that we facilitated on the issuing side, um, they were long tail. So they were alternative uses of established payment networks outside of traditional um, consumer lending and deposit access, stuff that wasn't mainstream. Um, but, you know, the same is, is true uh, uh, for other um, fintech initiatives during that period. I remember, you know, um, a lot of fintech being referred to back then as taking some paper-based payment system and automating it by making it electronic. Uh, or, you know, another obvious category was the emergence of e-commerce and the need for online acquiring. You know, I think what really changed um, around 2010 was that fintech was no longer 
going to be about innovation in the long tail. It seemed like it was going to be about disruption at the head of the demand curve. Um, the products and services that, de that are delivered at, at scale, um, you know, you know this uh, uh, as well as anyone with, you know, your background at, at Movin, um, that uh, it, it suddenly became about, um, you know, completely reinventing um, everything, the bank account, the credit card, uh, in, in the most fundamental uh, way. And so, um, you know, my uh, view of that uh, 10 years ago uh, and what led to starting Money 2020 was um, that this really was the result of, I think, the convergence of a few things. One was definitely the financial crisis. You know, up until the financial crisis, the barriers to entry at the head of the demand curve were just so high. Um, you know, compliance and regulatory, you know, banks just had a stronghold on things. Uh, it didn't matter, you know, what kind of legacy platforms organizations were working on. It didn't matter what the consumer experience was or, you know, fundamental things like fairness didn't really play in, in, into the function. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I think the financial crisis kind of uh, uh, gave way to a new kind of uh, thinking with those barriers coming down. Certainly the government's involvement with, you know, Dodd, everything from Dodd-Frank to creating the CFPB. I think another major trend kind of converging with that uh, right around this time, you know, leading to like, you know, there is going to be head of the demand curve disruption um, was mobile. Um, you know, the smartphone was introduced in 2007, but we immediately went into a financial crisis. And so there was a limited um, utilization of that in, in, in across the business models that it eventually went on to disrupt. You know, Uber is probably the one of the best examples. A lot of that innovation came after the crisis was over, um, you know, in the in the early 2010. So, um, so the the whole concept behind Money 2020 was that if the the definition of fintech, if if, if the goal of fintech was going to change in this fundamental and profound way, then people need to interact with each other differently. There's going to be, you know, a vastly different way that. Uh, that organizations work together. You know, I'll give you, I'll give you a personal example. Um, I remember pitching a major top 10 bank uh, in 2009. 2009, 2010, I forget exactly what year it was. And, um, and, it, and I was talking to pretty uh, senior people and their response was, listen, we love what you're doing at TX Via. We wish we could work with you, but it's really challenging for an organization our size to work with startups. It's just something that frankly, isn't even worth exploring. Um, you know, it was only a few months later that we were in the offices at Google showing them what we were doing and talking to them about how we could integrate and become part of Google Wallet. And their re reaction was, this looks too good to be true. Let's go to Pilot. We went to Pilot. From Pilot, they made an offer to, uh, to buy the company. And, and ultimately, that's how TXVIA ended up getting acquired by Google. So such a, you know, contrast in, uh, in uh, in the ability of organizations to to want to and uh, and be able to to work with startups seemed like all of that was going away and so the whole concept behind uh, money 2020 was we have a new narrative let's form that narrative let's bring organizations together and let's kick off what seemed to be a whole new era of fintech absolutely so, Jace. a lot of those changes you talked about have major structural implications in terms of how the industry even begins to function, you know, down to and including that comment that we can't actually partner with a startup like you, you know, I think you find organizations of all sizes are figuring out they need to change that. Do you think the decade is still kind of the right area of focus that's far enough in the future that it actually is thought leading versus you know, still tangible and actionable today. It feels like the world and everything you described is at an ever quickening pace. What, you know, do we need to be talking about money 25 instead of money 2020? Or, you know, is it still actually out a decade that we need to be uh, leaning into? You know, it's an interesting question because I, I think if you, let's talk about the last decade first and, and, and what's really happened there. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I heard someone describe what's happening now, and I think it's a, a good description of what's happened over the last decade, at least in terms of, of starting to happen, I guess. Uh, and that is the atomization 
of, uh, of payments, banking, and, you know, more broadly financial services, which is, you know, or maybe people talk about it in the form of unbundling, but I think unbundling, you might think, well, it's unbundling, uh, you know, uh, investing from credit and a bank account, for example. But what we're really talking about is, I think what you're describing, Jason, is a fundamental deconstruction of financial services in every respect, down to its most basic level. Um, and then with, you know, startups and, and individuals throughout the ecosystem, looking at each one of those uh, most fundamental, you know, particles and saying, um, actually, here's how you make this product the best it can be. Here's how it's going to best serve the consumer and, and you know, do what startups do best, focus relentlessly on doing one thing better than anybody else has ever done it before. And I think what we've seen is the first decade of that process. And, and it has resulted in, in, in new, you know, maybe call them point solutions, but it's also resulted in this deconstruction uh, and, and entirely new ways, you know, APIs are a good example, PLAD's a good example uh, of how that deconstruction has happened, but then given rise to, you know, new way, new, new types of connectivity, new types of what begin to look like networks uh, or ways that organizations will work together. So, you know, I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress over the last 10 years, but like anything, you know, it's one of those things where everything seems to kind of move slowly until it happens quickly. Um, and, and certainly the next, the last decade to me feels like it's been happening. It's been happening slowly. It's not like, um, you know, all the things that were, were operating at scale, going back to the whole, um, you know, the head of the demand curve is going to get disrupted. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's there yet in terms of it, uh, of, you know, products and services that people were historically using, you know, having gone away, I think that's still going to take uh, a long time to play out. Some of it will be generational. Some of it will be what you just described, which is that it takes organizations time, large established organizations. It takes them time to, um, you know, really restructure their processes. I think maybe it starts with attitude, but, um, but you've got to get down to, you know, processes, technology, you know, product roadmaps, um, technology roadmaps, and really be able to, uh, to be able to partner and, and change in a, in a practical way, uh, not just a, you know, a theoretical uh, way. So I think a lot of what we're going to see over the next um, uh, 10 years is that kind of continue to play out. Uh, and I think at some point, you know, we'll look back and say, wow, it really does look fundamentally uh, different. But but I don't think the last ten years is, has gotten us there. No, I think I, I think we're starting to see the the early signs. The buy now, pay later, which is a clear replacement for credit cards. You know, uh, you know, contextual credit versus uh, a credit product per se. Um, you know, we've seen certainly. You know, mobile wallets have overtaken plastic cards now globally in terms of transactions. Um, you know, there's behavioral savings that are coming. So there are the the early signs of exactly what you're talking about. Um, for Money 2020 in particular, I don't know, I do want to get on to the, the, the meetup, but, um, you know, this is such interesting history for the fintech audience, of course. So um, what would you say in terms of Money 2020 if you're talking about that ecosystem that's emerging, you know, the surviving banks, um, you know, I say those who digitized, um, because I think we'll consolidate the rest out. And then you've got the tech giants, you know, you mentioned Google, a, a partner of yours, um, and the fintechs, um, you know, that come in with either brands or specialization. Um, you know, this is sort of this combined ecosystem that's going to provide, um, you know, services for customers. But out of money coming out of money 2020 what was the greatest uh, i think example of where bringing those disparate crowds together resulted in something that you think was quite magical well wow. <laughs> you know that's a that's an interesting question i i guess i wouldn't i, I can't point to one specific thing because maybe that would be taking too much credit for all <clears throat> the different ways that people interact with each other, all the hard work that it takes to, uh, uh, you know, to figure out um, who you want to work with, how you want to work with them, 
uh, frankly, I think, you know, I look at that as, as, you know, the social capital of the industry, kind of the interconnectedness. Uh, and I think that, that there are a lot of individuals and institutions that have um, contributed to that social capital uh, over the past 10 years. Um, certainly the stuff, Brett, that you've done, uh, I think has been materially important in that respect. Um, Thank uh, you. So, yeah, so I, I think, let me answer it maybe a couple of ways. I think one is, um, it's certainly hard to say, you know, one particular organization or institution uh, was responsible for something. Uh, but at the same time, um, there has just been an incredible number of people that have come, to, come up to me over the years. Uh, and they have said, you know, I got my first client at your, one of your events. I got funding at one of your events. I found, you know, a portfolio company that did incredibly well at one of your events. Um, you know, I look back to some of the companies that, um, you know, that were brand new startups in, in, you know, the early 2000s, 2012, 2013, companies like Remitly and Acorns uh, that were part of Launchpad uh, programs at, at, at Money 2020. So um, while I think it would be, you know, way too much to uh, claim any credit uh, for um, for any of those successes, I think that um, that this social capital becomes critical um, in in allowing people to you know build things, uh, and it's a wide range of of social uh, capital. In fact, I think over the last year, one of the things that's been uh, eroded in this industry without the ability to physically go to events uh, is social capital. I, th I think it's been filled to some degree with some of the amazing, you know, Substack newsletters that have been introduced. Um, there's there's great Slack channels now that allow people to interact with each other, um, you know, pretty near real time. Um, uh, so there have been a few things that have kind of filled that gap. But but I, I kind of look at it like, you know, that that the the modernization, the evolution of fintech is a collective effort that you can't really do something on your own, you can't set out to say, well, I'm going to disrupt this particular product. You know, everything consists of a complex value chain. It's very hard to, you know, move money from point A to point B without, you know, deep, deep partnerships, um, lots of organizations working together. And usually when you're, you know, reinventing or uh, improving one particular thing within financial services, it's within the context of, um, of all of these other things. So. Um, so you need that social capital. I think, I think there's a, um, a, a greater need for it now, not only because it was somewhat eroded by the pandemic, but I also think that, that if you look at the nature of the landscape today, so we talked about what it was like 10 years ago, what's it like today? Um, you know, I think that um, you know, there is certainly this atomization going on, this breaking down to the component parts uh, some, you know, that unbundling, there's some rebundling going on. There's lots of debate around uh, how that will play out. Um, but I'd say that, that, you know, we're at this point right now where, you know, some fundamental uh, goals are being focused on, you know, how, how are these products more fair? It's not just fees, but in, in every possible respect. So for example, democratization of access uh, across everything. It could be um, you know, basic bank accounts, or it could be credit, uh, it could be investing. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can segment that, uh, uh, um, you know, in an, any number of, of different ways, demographically or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think another thing is just focusing on fundamental convenience, removing the clunkiness, so to speak. Um, you know, that, that, that has arisen over many decades and, and streamlining experiences so that they're, they're, they're more fluid, they're integrated into, you know, the, the context of what consumers are doing or companies are doing, et cetera. But what that's given rise to is, you know, the evolution of products, the rate at which new thing, new products are being introduced, the rate at which uh, value chains are being um, revisited and reconstructed. Um, you, you know, more at the individual level, new individuals entering the industry and, and gaining uh, prominence. You know, the establishment willing to modernize and, and engage in a, in a way that, 
uh, that is really unprecedented. So if you look at all of those things, in the end, ultimately, um, this is still an industry like any other, I, I would guess, that comes down to people and trust. So that social capital is, you know, something that's been somewhat eroded. The importance of it's become far greater. Um, and, and so, you know, lots of institutions, and I think kind of in an evolving way, contribute to that social capital. And I think, um, you know, may, maybe the way to answer your question is, maybe they all deserve a little bit of credit um, in, in helping this industry transform to the degree that it has. Well, in, one of the things that strikes me in what you said about that transformation, you really, if you look at where the transformation historically has been, it's been in that user interface. And then, you know, some to the product, you were one of the few, you know, call it you, Marquetta, Galileo, you know, really deep into the infrastructure. But now with that trend of atomization, you do see folks, you know, like Move and others that are actually going deep into the stack in terms of what they're reinventing. What does feel like it's ushering in an entirely new era of how it, fast innovation can take place when the actual underlying rails have been rebuilt. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, what used to be kind of um, uh, hard to do has become, you know, quick and easy. Um, and it's because, you know, basic infrastructure is being revisited. Um, and so I think you're hundred percent right. In fact, it's, it's kind of created the, created the flywheel um, where, you know, it's kind of like the data center, you know, how hard it used to be to manage that. And now it's in the cloud, the, the, the tools that you can now use to bring new products to market in modern ways. Uh, are like, you know, they're so wide, widespread at this point that, um, that it's created that flywheel. So the rate of innovation will increase for sure. Um, you know, if, if it's 3X, we'll see, you know, the equivalent of 30 years of disruption over the next 10 years compared to the last 10 years, for example. Um, but yeah, th those first iterations of what we were doing um, enabled others, but, but not in the most fundamental ways that, that things are, that, you know, today's initiatives are. So you want to take so us to I break, Jace? Yeah, so I was going to say, after the break, why don't we pick up and talk about what's next with FinTech Meetup and how you're aligning you know, your deep expertise in this area with what is the collaboration of the future going to look like after the break? Welcome back to Breaking Banks. Uh, if you were listening before the break, uh, we're today with Anil from uh, FinTech Meetup and, uh, of course, Money 2020. And Jason Hendricks is in the hosting seat with me. So, uh, Anil, um, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about the history of uh, FinTech over the last decade and, um, you know, how Money 2020 was, was part of that glue that brought people together. Um, but you've decided to do something different now. Um, you know, uh, first of all, let me, so FinTech Meetups, your new brand, your new event brand that you've created. Um, why, why did we need FinTech Meetup? Why didn't you just evolve uh, Money 2020? So I guess, firstly, uh, I haven't been involved with Money 2020 in, you know, over five years. Um, uh, it's, you know, phenomenal event. People get huge value out of it. Um, uh, and it's run by, you know, an organization that we had sold it to. Um, I actually spent the last five years on the other side of the transaction. I'd started a new event called Shop Talk. Uh, and Shop Talk was, I think the easiest way to think about it is what Money 2020 was for FinTech, um, Shop Talk was for retail and e-commerce. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that I started doing during the Shop Talk days um, with my background in technology was really starting to think about events as being tech enabled. Um, you know, people talk about in the future, every um, company will be a tech company. Um, they don't say every company except an event company will be a tech company. Um, but, uh, and so I have a fundamental belief that, um, that the future of events in general um, is going to be tech enabled. Uh, and so, um, you know, FinTech Meetup uh, is, uh, is, is a tech enabled FinTech event. Uh, it will utilize technology to, uh, bring people together, help facilitate connection, uh, and uh, various types of interactions. We're doing it online 
in June to, to kick it off with. But, um, you know, I've been doing offline in-person events for over a decade. Uh, and as soon as we're able to, we're going to take FinTech Meetup offline. Um, but it will still have a technology overlay. So probably the best way to describe it uh, is if you think of a traditional event format that has, you know, uh, brings people together, but then leaves it to them to figure out, you know, who they want to meet with, to contact them, um, to schedule meetings, et cetera. Uh, what we've done is um, we've automated that entire process. So I, I like to think of it like, you know, a taxi versus Uber. Um, you know, a taxi is a very manual process. You go out on the street, you put your hand out, you're trying to attract the attention of, of the driver. The driver is trying to do the same thing. And you're trying to, to make that, that connection, you know, to add value to both of you. Um, the Uber experience is obviously different. It connects you digitally, gives you the, you know, the profiles, the, the workflows, the opt-ins, the scheduling, uh, and then allows you to engage in an interaction and, and provide feedback. So, um, you know, we've essentially taken that very similar uh, model of, you know, profiles, workflows, scheduling, et cetera, and we've applied it to events. So we're launching FinTech Meetup uh, June 15 to 17 online because that's, that's really the only type of event you can launch right now, um, but with a plan to do it offline uh, going forward. So as I look at, you know, um, coming out of the shop talk experience, um, uh, the technology we had uh, implemented there, what we learned from that. Uh, and as I think about the next 10 years of events, I, I, see, I see events being uh, tech-enabled businesses uh, just like uh, any others. I think one of the important things about the tech-enabled isn't just you know, building on that idea of innovating deep in the stack. It's not just about making a prettier overlay, which you know, there's been event companies going after that or the tech companies and events forever. But one of the things I find very powerful about, you know, fintech meetup is, you know, to build on your Uber versus taxi analogy, you know, how often do you, would you jump in a taxi and it's their last ride of the day and you're headed to LaGuardia, but they want to be going the other direction and they kind of boot you out. And so there's that opportunity to align the interests. I think that's one of the things when I look at the vast array of people you could meet with at fintech meetup, it could be overwhelming unless you actually sift through and think through who is it? What am I attending this for? Who am I looking to meet with? What would you suggest for attendees to get the most out of the experience? How should they approach that? It's a good question. I, I think we've solved a lot of that through the way the technology works. So just to give you some context here, um, FinTech Meetup isn't something that you know we're launching um, this software for the first time. At this point, in some form or another uh, in the retail and e-commerce industry, we've done upwards of 100,000 meetings. Um, we've probably done <clears throat> around 80,000 offline at our events, uh, and we've done you know, around 25,000 online. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, thought being put into the process. There's a lot of feedback and iteration uh, that's being built back in. Um, and, and so, you know, I guess there's some fundamental, um, philosophies that, that we have. I think one is that knowledge of who wants to meet with who is widely distributed. What's really missing is the tool that allows people to act on that. So, um, you know, you mentioned that there, that there are other, you know, tools out there. It's not like the events industry has no techno technology at all. Uh, for sure, it has what I would describe as kind of basic uh, technology that's that's been used for a long time. There's online registration and ticketing system. There's a mobile app um, to to look at the agenda. There's the ability to request meetings with with people through a mobile app. Um, to me, you know, uh, frankly, if I were to compare, those things were great for what their objectives were. But if you were to to say the objective is really to facilitate interaction that ends up being a catalyst for, you know, the modernization of this industry through different types of interactions, particularly one-to-one -one meetings. I describe those as a calculator versus a spreadsheet. You can perform lots of calculations on a calculator and come out of it with a whole bunch of calculations, but it's fundamentally different to what a spreadsheet uh, allows you to do. And, and I'm using this, this as a very basic example. I think 
folks in fintech get what it means to improve things with technology beyond the fact that those things utilize technology before. Um, so we believe that that knowledge is widely distributed and we provide the tool that allows you to very easily act on it. So let me walk you through it a little bit. So the first thing we do is we gather, um, we ask people to complete profiles on themselves. That's at an individual level, it's at an organization level, and it consists of um, you know, something like 150 different FinTech data points. Tell us about what type of organization you are. Tell us what your delivery model is. Tell us um, which verticals and sub-verticals you operate in horizontally across those which products or solutions do you offer. So we're building these incredibly robust profiles and then we're sharing all of those uh, with everybody. So I think, I think that alone initially gives you this incredible insight into uh, everybody else that's there. The second thing we do is we make selections very easy. Um, we provide you with that list. We give you the ability to sort it, to filter it, to search it, so that you can distill it down to the things that are important to you. And then we give you a very easy ability. It takes less than 10 seconds uh, to request a meeting with someone uh, and provide them with a, with a reason. And, um, and, and I think it's that kind of basic workflow that uh, that also helps people find other people. You know, one of the things that people always, um, I, that I always talk to people about is what, is what is serendipity? What does it mean to have that serendipitous, you know, uh, meeting with someone at an event? A lot of times that serendipity is engineered. Uh, it is, you know, I know that I want to meet Brett King. Brett's going to be speaking. I'm going to stand in line you know, afterwards, and, and I'm going to get my, you know, 30 seconds with Brett, and I'm going to follow up with Brett. I'm sure, Brett, you've had that happen, you know, many, many times. Of course, yeah. Um, and so, you know, you know, maybe two years later, if that company ended up working with you, and someone says, well, how did you meet them? Oh, we randomly met at an event. It always feels more random uh, than I think people remember. Obviously, some things are more random. You're walking down the hallway, um, you're at a Starbucks or whatever, and, and, you, and you run into someone and, and something comes of it. Um, you know, I think that serendipity is kind of engineered into our approach. We give you a list of a thousand plus people. You see someone who used to work at MasterCard, they're now at Discover. You haven't talked to them in, you know, three or four years, but you've been uh, meaning to, you know, open the door to Discover in some way. You have a, you pick them for a meeting, um, you know, you, you end up having a conversation and it leads to something. So we're not trying to replace all of the interactions that happen on site. I would say a lot of interactions that happen on site uh, are gonna continue to happen on site. The June event is online because like I said, it, it, it can only be online. We're looking to replicate some things that can be done, uh, that are done offline, uh, that it can be done online. But, but again, our goal eventually is as soon as we're able, um, uh, you know, to, to move uh, the event offline and have have this digital overlay. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, South by Southwest and others are announcing that they're coming back in 2022, and you know, people's confidence to attend these events uh, is improving. Um, ultimately, when you look at Shop Talk and Money 2020, in, in both of those instances, um, you know, networking was obviously a key part of the success. Um, but you know, people would go for the big ticket content. Um, you know, speakers and things like that, the, you know, um, the headliners. Um, so um, you don't have any speakers at the event. So uh, first of all, how are people responding to that? And, and um, you know, specifically, you know, how did you sell it to sponsors that, uh, yeah, we don't need the content anymore because the networking is where it's at? You know, you kind of said it, Brett, like, you know, what, why do people go to these events? I think, I think we're at a point in fintech now where people go for the connections. They go to meet with people they know they haven't seen in a long time, and they go to build new relationships. You know, it's interesting around this time last year, when the pandemic first happened and events started getting canceled, um, pretty much every other event company, uh, their approach towards virtual events was to move content online. Um, speakers, fireside chats, keynotes, great, great content out there. Absolutely. Um, you know, we just didn't feel like that was a place 
it, and again, this is a reference back to shop talk now because a year ago, that's what I was doing. Um, we didn't feel that that was a place where um, we really could add the greatest value. We felt that, that you know, a, a big, big part, I don't know, maybe 80, 90% of the reason that, that people are at these events is to make those connections. And so we felt we wanted to give it a shot to help people make those connections online because we were already helping them make those connections offline. Our facilitated meetings program at Shop Talk was scheduling upwards of 15, 20,000 meetings um, uh, you know, uh, per event offline before the pandemic. So it was way more natural for us to say, let's see if we can solve that problem. We did do two virtual events in the, in the retail space um, that were meetings only. Uh, and it was interesting as I read some of the feedback, they said, you know, Shop Talk was known for content. It's really weird. It didn't have any content. Um, and so, um, you know, it was, I would say, I guess, an easier thing for us to do than maybe people felt that it should have been because we're so well known for the content that we put on. But, um, uh, but the feedback we got was, was phenomenal. So to give you some context, Shop Talk for Meetup, which was a no content, no speakers, online virtual meetings event, which we did in October of last year. We had 2,000 participants. We did almost 18,000 15-minute meetings for those individuals. We asked each individual to tag each meeting, satisfied, not satisfied, don't know. 91% of the meetings were tagged as satisfied. So, you know, I think it was pretty groundbreaking and we were able to accomplish something uh, and, and bring the industry together uh, the retail industry in a way that it wouldn't otherwise have had the ability to get together. People exchanged 120,000 reasons to meet each other. Um, it was pretty amazing. Um, we did it again about a month ago in the grocery space. We had 1,300 participants. We did almost 9,000 meetings. And we're going to do it again in, in May before we get to FinTech Meetup with an event called Shop Talk Meetup for Women. And there are over 1,000 women enrolled in that event already. You know, in terms of your question, Brett, uh, how, what's the response been in FinTech? Um, we've been out there for what, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 weeks um, promoting the event. We have over a thousand people already um, uh, committed to participating and in, in, enrolled uh, in the event. So we think we'll come in closer to, I don't know, 1,300 people, something in that range. Um, and, it, and it is, you know, a wide group of people. It's everyone from, you know, the fintech and innovation teams at large banks and networks and and processes all the way to the startup community the investment community i wouldn't be surprised if there were 100 investors there um I, yeah. I would imagine though you tend to get clustering around you know the biggest names and the biggest brands that people all want to meet them so how do you um support um, you know, like fintechs or startups, for example, that may be less known that, you know, really need these these meetings critically? Great, great point. Um, in fact, we, we are laser focused on, on the fintechs. I, my expectation is that there will be a few hundred of them there. Um, and, and we're making it, you know, relatively easy for them to be there. Uh, the pricing makes it, um, you know, unbelievably reasonable, frankly. When I talk to, to, to fintechs and tell them, you know, you, you can get tickets as you know, low as 150 bucks. And by the way, you want to reach credit unions, we're going to have over 100. You want to reach community banks, we're going to have over 100. You want to reach, uh, you know, large banks and institutions, uh, all of their fintech teams are going to be there. Um, and if you, you know, each individual has the ability to get up to 24 meetings, but our experience is that the sweet spot is eight to 10 meetings. You're talking about $15 a meeting no travel expense, no hotel or airline, uh, and the ability to, to connect with the industry in a way that frankly hasn't existed before because the technology hasn't been there. So we think we have a great proposition for FinTechs. I can tell you most of my phone calls at this point in, uh, in uh, educating the industry about this event um, is pretty much with FinTechs uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and explaining the, the proposition, getting them excited, helping them figure out who on their team should be there, even giving them advice on, you know, who to reach out to. Yesterday, we confirmed, um, you know, the folks on from digital and micro payments uh, and some other areas at, at MasterCard. They just confirmed nine SVPs and VPs participating. 
um, I went straight to some some fintechs that are participating and said, by the way, um, you know, these are some companies that you should make sure you reach out to uh, as some people you should reach out to during the event. Um, I don't know these individuals personally, but they they're participating. And I think that uh, you can get a lot of value out of meeting with them. So, um, you know, we've always been very high touch, um, you know, um, you know, when people used to see me at our offline events, they'll see me doing everything from, you know, uh, picking up trash on, on the floor. You know, we just, we have a, we have a deep caring and conviction to creating an, an unbelievable experience at the events that, that we run. Um, and the same is true here. So we're trying to help everyone in whatever way we can get the maximum amount of interaction and value. And then, you know, coming out of, uh, of the June event, we're going to announce our in-person event, the dates and location. We're very, very close, Brett, and I wish I could do it right here, right now, and tell you guys. That's okay. Yeah, when, you, when you're when you ready, you can you can come back on. It's, it's fine, no problem. Um, looking, obviously, at the pandemic, it has changed things. A lot of people want to get back to normal, but there's a new normal that's clearly emerging, um, the use of Zoom, um, you know, and, uh, you know, digital platforms like that is key. But, you know, taking that out another 10 years, you know, um, if, you know, we, we're about to see Apple um, launch their new um, pass-through AI, are, um, uh, you know, smart glasses. Um, we will, we see Facebook with Project Aria looking at similar technology, although with a slightly different purpose, you know, um, the AR glasses from, um, uh, you know, Apple are intended to replace TV viewing as an example. Um, and so, you know, the, the obvious question is, you know, when it, it, and Epic Games just announced a billion dollar investment in the metaverse, uh, very similar to Ready Player One's Oasis, uh, if you if you're familiar with that, or um, the world of Snow Crash, for example. Um, and so when do you think that um, we'll be able to have true hybrid events where you can be in a virtual representation of a physical space for a meetup or, um, you know, or a um, at attending in a, in a virtual audience for a virtual speaker on a virtual stage? Well, that's a good question. So let me break that down a little bit. Uh, you know, as I think about the future of events, I put it into a few categories. The first is I mentioned that, um, that I think, you know, when people say all, all companies will be tech companies, events companies will, will be tech companies going forward. Uh, um, to me, that is, that is a, uh, uh, an absolute that's going to happen. Um, and, and frankly, I, I'm not sure it's going to come from the events industry. I think if you look at something like Clubhouse, um, we have a platform now that allows you to put panels, um, you know, in, in, into a virtual context and, uh, and distribute content in a way that was really only in the domain of, of a physical event before. So, you know, I think that, that there might be some, um, more surprising angles at which people uh, think about, you know, events and, and how to digitize and virtualize them. Um, in, in that respect, I'd say, um, you know, the, 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 the events industry is going through the same unbundling, let's call it, that the fintech industry is. Sure. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so my view is that, that if I were to bucket it all and say, you know, when we think about the future of events and technology, I think of it more as the, the, the future of synchronous communication. You know, all of our communication used to be synchronous, face-to-face so -face or, you know, on the phone with, I guess, before the internet, the one exception being physical mail or maybe a carrier pigeon or something. But the vast majority of our communication was synchronous. You know, email made it obviously way more asynchronous. Um, but, you know, social media did in many respects as well. That feed isn't always real time. You consume it when it's convenient for you. I think if you look more recently, um, people have been continuing to strive to get more and more real time. You know, I think Slack uh, is, a, is, a, is a good example of that. Uh, I think that the amount of texting that happens now in a professional B2B context is a great example of that. You know, a lot of the founders of FinTech companies that I communicate with, we just communicate over text because it's easier and faster and everybody responds versus sending emails. Um, you know, when I think about events, I think about facilitating synchronous communication uh, with, with probably the one th thing being 
it's face to face. Now, face to face can be video, um, or face to face can be in person. Um, but it is the value of face to face. When I when I look at a fintech company, or I look at so maybe it's more about like our virtual avatars getting the dexterity to be able to express emotion and you know, mirror our own responses in that sort of synchronous communication. Possibly or AR, VR, you know, AR or uh, VR or enhanced. Yeah. yeah. Hey, listen, uh, we're, we've run out of time, Anil. So um, let's get to the important thing. Um, you know, tell us where people can sign up for June's FinTech Meetup. Well, they can sign up at our website, fintechmeetup.com. It's June 15 to 17. Like I said, we're over, over, over a thousand people uh, already uh, participating. We think it's going to be a phenomenal show. And I'd encourage uh, everyone to to get their ticket awesome and where can people find out more about you personally do you have a twitter handle um, so I'm, I'm pretty LinkedIn. much a neil d agarwal everywhere i am clubhouse twitter linkedin you know there are a lot of anil agarwals out there but uh, a lot fewer anil d agarwals okay great well, uh, Anil, it's been great to catch up again. Uh, good, good uh, reminiscing about some of the, uh, the the early fintech days. It's always good to do that. Uh, all the best with fintech meetup, and thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Guys, that's it for Breaking Banks this week. Uh, we will, of course, be back next week with more uh, content straight from the FinTech Epicenter. And uh, if you've got something to say about the episode today, don't forget to tweet us out at Breaking Banks One or at ProvokeCast. And make sure you leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, Podcaster, Spotify, wherever it is that you listen to the show. Um, and uh, hopefully a five-star review. That's how people find out about us and uh, hear more of the goodness and the content that we've got so appreciate your support we'll be back next week with another breaking banks that's it for this week if you like the show make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media we'll see you again next week with more breaking banks <laughs>